And we're going to be starting a series now called What's Love Got to Do With It? As we talk about developing healthy relationships and, and deepening our healthy marriages and friendships. And, and we're using the book The Meaning of Marriage. It's on the back table as kind of a, a jumping off book for our conversations in our studies, which one will happen right after worship today. Give yourself a little... 10 minutes or so for fellowship time, and then you're welcome to gather downstairs. There's a DVD conversation, and then Monday nights at 6.30, Laura Bishop and I, both of the sessions will be leading conversations to kind of take some of the stuff I'm talking about and, and enable us to go a little bit deeper on it, because obviously um, in this 18 minutes, it's pretty hard to do. Um, but, but I'm also aware of, as I move into the series, that... Um, there is no way that what I say, the amount of time that we have, even for a few weeks, can cover your circumstance, your issues, the things you're dealing with. Um, and so what I've asked you to do is, there's, there's a box, a colored, multicolored box on the back table with note cards. And if there are questions or issues that comes to your mind during this series that you would like to have us respond to, Write them down on your bulletin and go out to one of the note cards and write it and fold it and place it in the box and, and I will be the only one to look at it and uh, try to incorporate those questions or concerns in as we unfold this series over the next few weeks. Um, and we begin this series by asking this question. You know, when it comes to love and friendships and relationships, is love enough? I mean, don't we hear that sometimes in our own hearts and in the hearts of others? We, we hear that question, you know, if he really loved me, he would or wouldn't do this. If she really loved me, she would or wouldn't do this. Is love enough for a healthy relationship, a healthy friendship, a healthy marriage? And I, I think the answer is, is twofold. It's yes. And it's no. It's, it's yes because love is really, in the final analysis, the answer. It is, it is how God chooses to display God's love for us in the world. And, and in a perfect world, if we loved perfectly, it would be the answer. But, but the reality is we all know that I don't love perfectly. And I presume, if you're a human like me, that you don't love perfectly. Sometimes we have experiences in our lives. We, we grew up maybe with poor models for a relationship. Or we grew up with some unmet needs as we're, as we're growing up. Or, or trauma or difficulties happen in our life. And it truly does shape our hearts in ways that keep us from loving in, in the kind of way that God is calling us to love. So the answer is yes, love is enough. I, I have seen the end of the Bible, and it says that God's love wins. But we also know in our regular, everyday, day in, day out relationships that you and I love Him perfectly. And the question, therefore, is not is love enough, but what kind of love are you seeking to find? And even more importantly, what kind of love are you seeking to give? As people of faith, what kind of love are we meant and created for? And that's what I think this text that, that Rich and I wrote this morning begins to, to move us towards. God's vision for our friendships, for our relationships, and especially for our marriages. Because it tells us that, that from the beginning, God's desire was for us to be a relational people. To be in relationship, to be in friendships, and ultimately to marry in positive and life-giving ways. He says to Adam, it's not good for you to be alone. This is about us. It's not good that, that you need a helpmate, you need a helper. And, and the, the Hebrew word in that text for, for this helpmate that God is bringing in this woman in this, part, in this text is, is the Hebrew word easier, E-Z-E-R. And it really refers to someone stronger who's coming to help someone weaker. Now women, don't let that go to your heads too fast. Because men are helpmates too. 
that God has given us relationships, significant others in our relationships, that we may be helpmates for each other, because we're not meant to live alone. We're meant to be in relationship. And God sends and brings people into our lives to be helpmates. In fact, Adam Hamilton says the best way to understand that, that definition of Ezer in the Hebrew definition is that it is two people bringing their mutual strengths together in order to bless one another. How about that? To bring your unique gifts, your talents, into the relationship in order to bless one another. And then, of course, Adam falls to sleep, right? And God creates this helpmate from his rib, and he wakes up and he goes, he ya this is meeting my soul of souls. To have this special person in my life, this special relationship, this unique friendship, this, it, for those of us who are married, a marriage, there is something about having that, a person, a relationship in our lives that is soothing and fulfilling and life-giving. And I love how the scripture said that when, when he awoke and, and they hung out together, it says that they were naked and they were not, what? Embarrassed. Embarrassed or ashamed. I love that. Because I think it's telling us more than the fact that they may not have had clothes on and needed fig leaves. It's telling us that, that they had no shame. They had no fear of being vulnerable with each other. They didn't have any fear of having their weaknesses exposed to this significant other. They didn't have a fear of running into trouble or difficulties along the way. They had no fear of being changed by the person they're in relationship with. They had no trouble. They didn't have to hide anything to be in love or to win someone's love. They just lived in it. And, and the other part that we don't see but is so there is God's in the middle of it. God is there the whole time. And that's a vital part of they have nothing to be afraid of. And then something happens, doesn't it? What happens next? Yeah, the snake. And, and you know, some versions say, and the devil and Satan, but, but really, it is literally in the Hebrew, it is serpent. It's not Satan. Satan is a, is a later reading from centuries later that we have read back into this original text. It literally is serpent. And we read back Satan, but that's not the original intention. I think the serpent is more about this part of our lives where all of a sudden we're introduced to a new idea that, that maybe, maybe even though we're made for more, that maybe we are not enough. You know, that, that temptation to, to practice some form of ideology that says, there's something about me that's, that, that maybe I'm not enough. You know, that, that idea you get in our head that, because of someone said or or because of what how someone treated you, all of a sudden you go, there must be something wrong with me, and and maybe 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 there's something else I need, and and so rather than find that in our relationship with God, first we begin to substitute other things for that relationship, and God slowly gets moved off to the to the sideline, and and they eat, and if you look at the text. Yeah, Eve ate it first, right? But what did she do with it? She gave it to Adam. And what did Adam do? He didn't go, oh, no, no, no. We shouldn't eat that. He said, yeah, sure, I'll try it. <laughs> Even though he knew the same thing. So, so it's a little bit unfair to just blame the women, the Eves in, in the world. It's, they both have responsibility for that. I think that's one of the things the scripture tells us. And so, all of a sudden, their status has changed, haven't they? You know, now they're walking towards a tomb. Remember my Easter message? What's your status? Now they're walking towards a tomb, and they're not sure it's going to be open again. And now God shows up, and they're in the garden, and, and, and they're hiding. He can't see them. Where are you? Where are you? We were ashamed, they said. All of a sudden, fear. In uncertainty, all of a sudden embarrassment starts to show up in the picture. All of a sudden this sense that maybe I'm not enough. I'm not loved for who I am. 
And so what does God do? Now, let me, let me back up. For some people, this is literally a true story. For other people who read this, it's, it's poetry and figurative language. I believe this is an archetype story for our human condition. Born and created for a life-giving relationship with God, meaningful relationship with each other, we also find something else is at play, isn't it? There's another dynamic of our human condition. And what is that? As much as we strive to love someone selflessly, what happens? We find ourselves choosing also for ourselves. Huh? There's that self-centered part of our nature too, isn't it? That somehow maybe we do think we're not enough. So there's something I have to grab in order to add to my being to finally make me feel whole instead of realizing we are loved and cared for just like we are. And that's our human condition. That's what the Bible talks us about. It's an archetypical story. How did we get here? What does this mean? What does relationships mean? What does marriage mean? And what it begins to tell us is we are made for this life-given relationship. But we also have this other part of our nature that the Bible calls sin, which drives us to care for ourselves first. And not only push God out, but even those who we love the most. And therefore we love imperfectly. And that is our human condition. That's, what it, that's one of the things it tells us. So what's God's response to all of this? What's God's response? From that moment, even after God brings punishment to them, a consequence for their choices, that God spends the rest of Scripture trying to find some way to bring them back into that place of communion and union with God ultimately ending up in the gift of Jesus. That is God's ultimate response to this place of disconnect, to this yin and yang in our heart and in our souls. And he does it with a unique kind of love. It's called agape love. It's the Greek word agape, which truly means the kind of love in which you are willing to give yourself for another. It's what we see in what Jesus demonstrates, both with his life and especially with his death. When he's on the cross, he shows us what this love looks like. It's agape love. He tells it to his disciples, and that before he dies, he says, No greater love has one than to lay one's life down for your friend. That's the pattern of what this agape love is to look like. That, that's the pattern for what God wants our relationships to be like. It is mutual sacrifice for the fulfillment of another. It is mutual fulfillment in relationship by mutual sacrifice or self-giving for each other. Tim Keller says in the book that God had the gospel in mind when he established relationships, significant relationships, and marriage is God's plan for our human lives. Now, Ellen and I, when we get time to spend together, you know, one of those days where you're with your spouse or your good friends or your loved ones and you're spending a whole vacation time together, what typically happens when you're spending all that time together? Oh, you can be honest. Come on. Oh, you get an argument. You have a little disagreement. You know, I remember when my kids, when uh, I'm in my second marriage, so I, I have to say this, by the way. I should have said this at the beginning. I come at this imperfectly, this whole series, this whole journey. And so I value your feedback both in classes or in conversation. Um, you know, Ellen and I both are in our second marriage. So I'm not standing up here like I'm an expert. I'm on the journey with you, and we're going to journey and, and grow into it together. Um, but when my kids would come and stay with me on weekends, those, those weekends, you know, we got along great. You know, but, but when they came for a week, <laughs> after those three days, all of a sudden we started banging heads. And it's the same thing in our relationships, right? But, but what, what this agape love tells us is you have three choices in those times in your life. When you spend so much time together that, that every few minutes you have an opportunity to make a choice. You have three choices. One is to serve one another with joy. Another is, is uh, to serve one another 
with joy, with coldness and resentment, uh, or to selfishly insist on your own way. We always have the choice. And of course, a marriage that thrives, a friendship that grows, a significant relationship that thrives is one when we first seek to love each other that first way. When we desire to serve the other with joy. In the message, right? But there's a caveat, isn't there? What's the caveat? That's the goal, isn't it? A God by love, mutual sacrifice, mutual fulfillment through mutual sacrifice. But what gets in the way? Huh? Ourselves. Ourselves. I mean, really, can you do it all the time? I can. And, and, and so there are barriers to that process, isn't it? You can't do it all the time. So I think the reality is we need help. We need help. We, we need to look for a power and a resource beyond ourselves. I mean, we all know those places when we feel out of whack, and we feel out of balance, and we feel disconnected from even those who are closest to us. Or, or maybe we even feel it in our own hearts and our own lives. And in places like that, we need to call out and ask for help from God and ask God to help fill me with your Holy Spirit. With that spirit of agape love that was so powerfully demonstrated in Jesus' life. That's what we call surrender to conversion, you know. Let my life and my love be changed and transformed by your love. But there's not just conversion, that it, the calling out for help and asking God to fill you and forgive you and, and empower you. This, there's another big word we call sanctification. And that's where God, breathing the Holy Spirit, helps grow us. Helps grow us. Grow us. So that the fruits of the Spirit become known and seen through us. It's called sanctification. That's why I, I, you will always hear me stress, why does worship matter? Why does, why does prayer matter? Why does having a devotional life where you, where you go online to some devotional or use the upper room matter? Why does gathering in Christian community or, or small groups matter? Because those are the ways that the Holy Spirit of God begins to keep working on us and shaping us, moving our hearts closer to this goal of a God made love. And the saying is, you tend to hit what you aim for. And so the question is, what are we aiming for in our relationships? And how we live with one another, and how we love with one another. Now, there are more details to all of this that we're going to be covering throughout the series. But, but, but I want to end with two things. What, what is the vision you have for your relationship and your marriage? Is it this God God-given vision? And what are you doing to help make it possible? We, we have some cards that we want you to, to leave with today. One is, if you don't have a prayer life with your spouse, I encourage you to take, here's a card for spouses. There are cards for spouses and, and cards for, for individuals. Um, one on each side that, that we'll bring towards the door. And, and what I would like you to do, if you don't have a prayer life with your spouse, right before you fall asleep and collapse in bed after you've taken care of the kids, grab your spouse and say, let's pray this together. And do it every day. And, and if you see something come out of this, don't be afraid to tell me quietly. I won't share the news unless you want it to. But if you're single in a, in a relationship or in, fresh, in, in friendship, we also have cards uh, for you too. Something you can pray with your friends or even by yourselves. And the focus of the prayer is, God, help my love to reflect your unconditional love so that I may embody, embody the love of Christ in this world. All God's people said. Amen. Amen.